Welcome to writing unit testable code in Drupal 8. My name is Kat Bailey. Um, I've been involved with Drupal since about 2007. And um, I've had a little bit of involvement in Drupal 8 uh, core development, uh, specifically the Whiskey Initiative. Uh, that's the initiative that's been responsible for bringing in a lot of the Symphony code uh, into Drupal. Um, and before I get started, I just, there was a just wanted to mention a couple of things. So I will be assuming a rudimentary understanding of object-oriented programming. By that, I just mean that you know, you'll know what I'm talking about when I talk about classes and interfaces and methods, but there won't be anything very complicated. Um, so if the only exposure you've had to writing object-oriented code is maybe writing views plugins or something, that's totally fine. And the other thing I wanted to say is just, uh, you've, I'm sure you've all heard about these huge sweeping changes in Drupal 8. Um, and, uh, you know, it's true, like the nature of the changes in Drupal 8, it's, they're, they're far greater changes than we've seen in previous releases of Drupal. And uh, I just want to say, uh, you know, don't be put off. Like these, the nature of these changes is such that like we're moving towards more standard ways of doing things. We're getting away from Drupalisms and we're aligning ourselves with basically what the rest of the world is doing. Um, so even though it'll take some time to wrap your head around some of this, learning some of this new stuff, um, that's going to stand to you no matter where your programming career takes you uh, beyond Drupal. Um, okay, so what I'm going to cover today is just uh, you know, a brief introduction to what unit testing is all about. Uh, then I'm going to look at the dependency injection design pattern um, and how that helps us to write unit testable code. Um, and then look at writing uh, unit tests in Drupal 8 using PHP unit. Okay, so what is unit testing? The purpose of a unit test is to verify the behavior of a unit of code in isolation, so independent of its normal application context. A unit of code could just be a function, you're just testing one particular function, or maybe you're testing an entire class if it's a small class. Um, it's basically the smallest piece of code um, that you can test. Um, so most commonly, most commonly it'll be a method in a class. Um, unit tests are not a replacement for integration tests. So although you, you will have tested, verified the behavior of your individual units of code, you usually also want to make sure that they're gonna work together the way you intend them to work together. Okay, so why do we need them? Um, the benefits of unit tests, well, the main one is uh, they are extremely fast to run. So in core, in Drupal 8 core now, I think there are about a thousand tests and it takes about six seconds to run all of them. Um, so, you know, you compare that to simple tests, web tests, um, uh, it's pretty persuasive. Um, they also act as documentation for your code, because when you look at the tests for a particular method or something, that gives you a great understanding of what, you know, what that method is, is for, how it's meant to be used. Um, and uh, so refactoring, they make refactoring your code easier because the changes you make if you have unit tests that verify the behavior that your code um, should have, then you, know, you can run the test to make sure you're not breaking things. Um, so that's, the, that fourth, fourth point is, is very closely related to that. The fact that you, as you're writing, if you have tests, uh, you can be running them because it takes, it's so easy to run them and they can be providing constant feedback to you know, let you know if you've broken something. Okay, so just to look back again at that definition of a unit test. Um, they verify the behavior of a unit of code in isolation, right? So this, this idea of um, context independence is key, not just to um, understanding why unit tests are so fast um, and have the benefits that we just saw, but also in understanding what the implications are for code that is unit testable. Um, because it, ha it has other implications for the actual, the code itself. Um, so we step back a bit and look at how do we test context dependent code, by which I mean pretty much all the code in Drupal 7. Um, and how, how do we test that? So uh, taking that as an example, there's a Drupal 7 contrib module called subpath auto. And what it does is it allows you to have, so say you have, um, path aliases from, it, it basically allows you to resolve the subpath of an alias to a subpath of the, of the source path. So that's what subpath auto module does, and I'm just using it as an example. The, the sort of core functionality uh, in Drupal 7 
goes something like this. So you're basically trying to resolve a path. Maybe the, maybe the path is like content slash some node slash some subpath. Um, and it's going to use core's Drupal lookup path function. It, it'll manipulate it by chopping off bits to see if it'll, it can find an alias um, as it manipulates, gets rid of bits off the subpath, and then it puts it back together again after it's used core's uh, path lookup to, um, to, get the, to resolve the alias. So that's the basic functionality of what this module does. Um, and so it has a dependency on the Drupal lookup path function in core. So it assumes that that, you know, that function has to exist or this code is going to um, blow up. And then Drupal, Drupal lookup path itself has a whole bunch of dependencies. So it, it depends on this um, global language URL variable. Uh, and then all these various functions, Drupal static, Drupal path alias whitelist rebuild, which in turn depends on DB query, which of course uh, depends on having a database in place. Um, so the code, so all these functions have to have been loaded, um, and then obviously things like databases need to be in place. So to test that functionality, um, the subpath auto core functionality, you have to install Drupal, um, you have to add some path aliases, and then you can verify the behavior of that, that you know, small piece of code. Um, now, object-oriented code can also have problematic dependencies. So, uh, imagine you have a class that relies on this other class that is obviously a something to, you know a database connection. Um, if you want to test that class, uh, you have to ensure that the other class that it depends on is is loaded. You also there has to be a database available as well, and then you can verify the behavior. So this is a quote here from a book called Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tests. Um, for a class to be easy to unit test, the class must have explicit dependencies that can easily be substituted and clear responsibilities that can easily be invoked and verified. Now, if you think about that for a second, doesn't that just sound really reasonable? Like, it's not as if for a class to be unit testable, you have to do all these kind of weird things that'll make it unit testable. No, for a class to be unit testable, you have to do these things that just make sense anyway as a way of writing your code. In other words, unit testable code is better code. Um, and what all that hangs on is the fact that, you know, writing a test for your code is the first time you're actually reusing your code. It's making your code reusable and context independent. So how do you achieve that? How do we get, get from implicit dependencies as we saw in uh, the subpath autocode that was all, you know, these implicit dependencies like that were just going to blow up when you try to test it without those things being uh, available. And how do you get from there to explicit dis dependencies? Obviously, you know, your code is going to have dependencies. You can't write, um, you can't get rid of these dependencies and still have code that has, a, you know, clear responsibilities. Um, but the key is to make these dependencies explicit. And dependency injection is how we achieve that. Um, so this next bit is just going to be explaining what dependency injection is. Um, it's almost too much to, to say it's a design pattern because it's such a simple idea um, and it scares people off because it sounds really complicated, um, but it's really very simple. Um, so here's another example of a class that has a dependency. So this notifier class uses another class, the mailer, um, to send an email, right? So in the constructor for this notifier class, uh, it instantiates an object of the mailer class, which it then uses, to, it calls the send method, and it uses this mailer class to, to send an email. Um, that doesn't look too problematic, but you know, what if, what if that mailer class has um, parameters that need to get passed in? Uh, maybe it, you need to specify what the transport mechanism is or whatever. Um, so all of a sudden, this class is in the business of knowing how to instantiate this other class, um, which it really shouldn't be. You know, it's, 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 it should have just its own responsibility and it shouldn't, it shouldn't need to know about um, this other mailer class. So how do we change that? In this version, rather than instantiating the mailer class in the constructor, it's being passed in as a constructor parameter. So I'm just uh, going to go back and forth. That there, the difference between um, instantiating the class with it, whatever it needs, in the constructor versus passing it in as a constructor parameter 
that's dependency injection. Like, that's all there is to it, really, um, in its most simplest form. Um, and at the bottom there, I've just shown how you would actually then call this. So um, you'd have to instantiate a mailer object and then pass that in when you're instantiating your notifier. Your code should basically be as ignorant as possible. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, basically, it's, it's all about making sure that your code knows as little as, as possible in order to do its own job. And so when you think about it, in this example, what does the notifier class need to know about the thing that it's going to use to send the email? Does it actually need to even know what the concrete class is? Does it need to know it's an instance of the mailer class? It doesn't. All it really needs to know is that it can call whatever methods on it that it needs to call. In this case, it just needs to know that it can call the send method on this thing. And the way we express that is using an interface. So the change here is that instead of passing in a concrete class, um, we just specify the mailer interface. Um, so as long as something gets passed into the notifier constructor um, that implements the mailer interface, it's happy. It doesn't care what the specific implementation is. It's not its job to care about that. And so at the bottom there, you can see that you could instantiate this other thing, the new special mailer, um, which also implements this interface, and pass that in, and that's all fine. So that there is constructor injection. Um, and uh, basically, so it's about declaratively expressing dependencies in the class definition rather than instantiating them in the class itself. So your class is just saying, look, I need this thing to do my job. It's not my business, like how this thing is created or anything. I just need it. And so if you want me to do what I do, then you have to pass me this thing. Um, <clears throat> Constructor injection is not the only form of uh, dependency injection. It's by far the most common, and certainly in Drupal 8, it's the most common form that we use. Um, there's also setter injection, which is worth mentioning. Um, so in setter injection, rather than passing the dependencies in the constructor, you'd have a, a setter method. In this case, we have a set mailer method that takes the mailer object and sets that as the instance variable. Um, <clears throat> and at the bottom there, you can see how you would call this. Um, so you would instantiate the mailer, instantiate the notifier, and this time it's not taking any constructor parameter, and then you'd call the set mailer um, method with uh, passing in the mailer. Now obviously the problem there is until you call the set mailer method, this notifier class is essentially useless. It's not going to be able to do its job. So, um, so using setter injection isn't always the way to go, but it can be um, helpful if, for example, you wanted to provide um, a sane default for a particular property and then be able to override it using a set method. Um, that's a pretty common pattern. Um, interface injection, I mentioned really only for completeness because it exists, it's a thing, but um, it's, very, it's not very common. Uh, it's basically like setter injection, except for each one of those setter methods, like set mailer, that um, corresponds to an interface. So there's an interface defined for that particular uh, setter method. So it's very verbose because you need all these interfaces for all your setter methods um, and not very common. Um, dependency injection is often referred to as inversion of control. And to explain why and what, what that inversion is all about, um, basically traditionally, you would have had, you might have had a library of classes that your code would use. So um, you know, you, you would instantiate an object of a particular class that's provided by some library. And in this case, the library is passive. It's just there providing a bunch of classes that you may or may not choose to use. And your code is active. Your code is saying, um, you know, maybe in its con constructor or whatever, it's saying, yeah, I want to instantiate a mailer object or whatever that's provided by this library. So your code is active and the library is passive. Whereas with dependency injection, that gets flipped around. And now your code is passive because it's just there saying, uh, you know, declaratively expressing its dependencies, saying this is what I need to do my job. You need to, so the framework needs to call your code with its dependencies. And so that's the sense in which control has been inverted. <clears throat> so um, inversion of control is also referred to as the Hollywood principle, because um, as they say in Hollywood, don't call us, we'll call you. Okay, so that's basically dependency injection. Um, 
that's the most important thing you need to know about dependency injection. Like, it's this very, very simple concept of passing uh, an object, its dependencies, um, as parameters, either in a constructor, in its constructor, or in a setter method. There are other aspects of dependency injection, and certainly if any of you have been keeping up with um, Drupal 8 core development, you may have heard about the dependency injection container. Um, I'm not going to cover that in this talk, because I'm focusing more on the unit testing side of things, but um, the, the dependency injection container is basically the, the thing in Drupal core that actually does the injecting of, of dependencies, and you, you configure it to inject particular instances of, of classes um, into these things that have, have expressed their dependencies, classes that have expressed their dependencies. Um, <clears throat> so we're now going to look at how, where that gets us in terms of writing unit testable code. So let's have a look at how you might rewrite the, the subpath auto functionality in Drupal 8. Um, so that, that lookup function is, is is where we're basically implementing that same functionality that we saw in the Drupal 7 version that, that relied on um, Drupal lookup path. Um, but this time it's a class. We have this subpath auto class. And um, in its constructor, it's going to receive this thing that implements an interface. Um, this is a core, an interface provided by Drupal core called inbound path processor interface. Um, and so our class just needs to know it's going to get one of those. Um, and that's going to be its path processor um, <clears throat> property. And so when it does the lookup, it basically it's delegating to that path processor. And it, it's just going to say, look, process this path. And then it, this code only cares about that manipulation about the subpath, because that's what it's doing. Um, it doesn't care about the fact that um, this path processor might need to look in a database table to find what the actual source path is for a given alias. That's not this this class is concerned. This class's only concern is saying, once it has this thing that processes the path and does something with it, then it does this subpath manipulation. <coughs> so this subpath auto uh, functionality can now be used um, with anything that implements that interface. Um, so you could, you could pass it something else that has nothing to do with looking up paths in a database. Um, so it's, it's reusable code. Um, and as I said before, the first time you get to reuse your code and like prove the re reusability of your code is when you write it, um, a test for it. So how would we test this? Okay, so Drupal 8 ships with PHP unit. Um, it's the standard unit testing framework for PHP, um, actively maintained. Um, it's integrated in most PHP IDEs. Um, it's not simple test, in other words. Uh, and um, and importantly for this discussion, it's, it supports this idea of test doubles. Um, so what test doubles are all about is if you remember um, that quote about how um, <clears throat> making a class easy to unit test, we needed to have explicit dependencies that could be easily substituted. So test doubles is about providing substitutes uh, of those dependencies in your tests. Um, and there are various different types of uh, test doubles. Um, we're going to focus on stubs and mocks. Um, these definitions come from Martin Fowler, has a very good write-up about the, the differences between stubs versus mocks and the various others. So um, <clears throat> stubs provide canned answers to calls made during the test, usually not responding at all to anything outside what's programmed in for the test. That'll makes sense once you see an example, which we'll see shortly. Um, mocks are objects that are pre-programmed with expectations uh, which form a specification of the calls they're expected to receive. And again, we'll see some examples of mocks, so that'll make more sense to you. Um, I've also included the definitions of dummies and fakes. Um, so dummies are passed around but never actually used, uh, and they're usually just there to fill parameter lists. That's fairly straightforward. And then fakes actually have working implementations, but usually take some shortcut, which makes them not suitable for production. So an in-memory database is an example of a fake object. OK, so here again is our um, subpath auto class um, uh, that we need to test. So here's an example of how you could test that behavior with a mock. So what we need to do is we're, we're going to create a mock of the dependency of the subpath auto class. Remember, it has a dependency on 
this thing that implements the inbound path processor interface. So PHP unit has this method called get mock, and you just pass in what interface or class you want it uh, to create a mock of, um, and it does that for you. Um, so that's what we're doing in the first line there. We're just saying, give me a mock uh, so that it'll be an object that implements this particular interface. Um, and then the next line where it says processor expects, we're setting up a particular expectation. of how, It's about how we want, um, we're, we're basically going to be testing how the subpath auto class interacts with our mock. And we're saying that we expect that the process inbound method will get called exactly once on our mock object during this test. Um, and so you'll notice there's no actual explicit assertion there. You know, if you're, if you're familiar with writing um, simple test tests, you're always asserting equals or asserting true or asserting this, that, or the other. Um, in this case, the assertion is basically the fact that so if, the, if this method gets called more than once or if it doesn't get called at all, this test is going to fail. So that's where the assertion is. It's just like this, this test will only pass if that expectation is met. Um, and yeah, so there are some other expectations that you could use to set up on your, on your mock. So in this case, um, where I'm saying my mock expects this at zero, what I'm basically saying is the very first method that gets called on my mock object will be some method. Um, so you're just, you can be really, really particular about exactly what methods you expect to get called on your, uh, on, on your mock object. Um, so that when you, you pass your mock object into your, the class that you're actually testing, you call some methods on that class, your class, um, and you can be very, very particular about exactly how it's going to interact with the mock that you passed it. Um, so it has all these kinds of um, methods that you can use uh, to specify exactly what your expectations are for that interaction. Um, so in this case, we're saying the first method that gets called on my mock will be, the, will be this sum method method and the, with these particular parameters passed in. Um, and the last bit there will, and then this return value, that's uh, where, you know, you're, you're, the class that you're testing is going to interact with this mock and it's going to expect a particular value. Um, you know, in certain cases, it's going to expect a particular value and then work with that value. Um, so you can then specify what your mock should return when the class calls that method on it. Um, so that's, that last part isn't about expectations, um, but the, uh, the previous part is all just about setting up these expectations. Um, here's another even simpler one where you're just saying, um, my expectation is that the sum method method will never get called on my mock during this test. And you might use that if um, in a particular test where you want to, you're testing a particular path of code where, you know, for, for certain parameters that are passed into your method or whatever, it's going to bypass, it's never going to need to use that thing, that dependency. And so that's how you would, uh, you would test this. Um, you're basically saying, if I pass in these parameters, um, the, the, this method should never get called on my mock. Okay, so stubs, um, if you remember, stubs are about providing these canned responses. Um, so that's when you're basically saying you have this thing, you know your class is going to want to interact with this thing, and um, so you just set up, you know what methods it's going to call, and you want to just provide these canned responses to those methods. So although we're using the get mock method in PHP unit, it's actually a stub. The difference is just in how you use it. It's the same thing. Um, so the difference between a mock and a stub is, is, is how you actually use it. Question? Is there a test that are being generated when you call the expects method? Um, no, PHP unit in the background is, you've basically told PHP unit what you expect to happen. And if that isn't what happens, then the test fails. So, so, if, so if, yeah. if when you, when you um, call the lookup method on the class that you're testing, and it ends up actually call, calling the, whatever, the process inbound method um, on the mock. Twice. Uh, twice or never when you've, when you've set an expectation that it should be called exactly once, then the test fails. Okay, so this is a type of assert. Oh, yes. Assertion, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the expectation being met is asserting the, yeah. Great, and, and just related to that, was that a complete example for our uh, mock 
that you did for the lookup, the sub path? Sorry, was this? For, yeah, this when you created the mock, it doesn't return anything, but didn't we need the return value here? Uh, where, where I'm getting the mock, or I'm not? Oh, oh, I don't need, oh, oh, okay. It just, yes, it so happens that um, it will need to return a value. So yes, well spotted. I chopped that out for simplicity, but in this particular implementation, yeah, um, the processor uh, is, is gonna have to return a value, otherwise the, um, the yeah. Nice catch, thanks. <laughs> I wasn't trying to catch it, first time I've seen it. <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, that's why you generally are going to have to have this will return value thing, um, because the chances are it's a method that's supposed to return something. Um, and okay, so stubs. Um, yeah, so as I said, we still use this, this get mock method provided by PHP unit, but we're using it as a stub. Um, and you'll always, essentially the kind of the difference is, if you'll notice in my expects uh, line there, it just says this, any. Uh, and all we're saying is, look, any time this method, the sum method method gets called, um, return this value. Uh, so we're not, we're not setting up an expectation, we're not saying it has to only get called once or it should never get called. We're just um, saying what it should do if it gets called so that our um, class that we're testing can use it. Um, and you can get more complicated. So in this case, we're saying, uh, we're, we're providing a, va a return value map um, so that you can then specify for all the different parameters that might get passed in when the, when the particular method is called, you can specify um, what value you, sh you should return. And you can do, do even more complicated things, like you can, ha you can have a return callback um, where you have a function that has some logic in it about exactly what to return, uh, depending on what, what parameters are passed in when the method is called. So this is an example of using a stub um, in the, uh, for the subpath auto, um, for testing the subpath auto class. So in this case, um, we create our, our stub um, and we basically set, up, set it up so that any time the process inbound method gets called on our stub uh, with content slash first node as the parameter that's passed in, we want to return node slash one. And so what this is doing is basically eliminating the need, if you remember, to test this functionality in Drupal 7, we had to do a web test which would install Drupal, like set up a whole database, and then you had to actually add path aliases to the database so you'd know they were there so that when Drupal lookup path got called with content slash first node, that it would actually return node slash one. We don't need any of that now, we just use this stub. And so um, using this stub then, we, we do create an assertion. We're actually asserting what, ha what happens. So we can assert that um, when we do a lookup path, when we look up a path with content slash first node slash A, so slash A is our subpath, um, we can assert that it's going to return node slash one slash A. And we're, we're there, like we're, that is testing our functionality, which is about the subpath part. We don't care about the looking up aliases part. Um, so incredibly powerful and incredibly easy to write um, and fun. Um, and that's basically all I had. Um, I've put some resources here. So uh, I, there's a blog post that I wrote that's very much um, along these same lines. Um, Mark Sonnebaum um, gave a related talk in Prague. It focuses more on, on unit testing and has some more um, advanced examples. And um, then I have some examples specifically about dependency injection um, on my um, catbailey.github.io. Um, so any more questions?